Joe Biden has always regarded himself as being the most pro-labor guy ever to sit inside the Congress. And everything he's done on labor issues has reflected that kind of bias. I have no doubt that that's Joe remembering what he believed before he got into office and putting it into effect. Um, when you start getting to some of the other stuff about the antitrust and bigness and badness and things like that, uh, I tend to think that there was a part of Biden which sort of stuck that. But I would say the influence of the staff on those issues has been much more powerful. But again, it's really complicated because the influence on these issues, many of them came with respect to whom did you appoint a particular officer. And so, you know, he appointed the head of the FTC, Lena Khan, and she turns out to be a dangerous autocrat, doesn't know much about her subject matter area. Um, and he got her through and then made her chair of the FTC. The organization internally is in revolt. Um, Gary Gensel was thought to be a kind of a centrist guy. Now that he's taken charge of the um, SEC, he puts out ruling after ruling, all of which are terrible. And one of my former students and a good guy named Hal Scott, now emeritus from Harvard, he was a Chicago student. He said, these were all illegal and they're going to all be challenged in court one way or another. So I don't know who's responsible for that. Um, you put into place a lot of other people at one time or another. And what you see in all of these kinds of situations is that they all moving left simultaneously, all of them even moving further left than they otherwise were. And there's literally nothing that you can do to stop. Um, so uh, the whole thing, I think, becomes enormously complicated um, in terms of this. It's also the other issue that people don't like to say is Biden was never very smart. I mean, it's sort of a blunt assessment of it, uh, but he was very shrewd politically. And now people think he's basically... He's too old to be precise. He's my age, right? Um, we're both 79 years of age, but you know, he has really lost it. People don't think he knows how to read a teleprompter at this point anymore. There are the constant gaps that are going on one way or another. And so uh, there are some people kind of think it's sort of like Edith Head, Edith Wilson taking over the United States presidency de facto when Woodrow Wilson started to fail in the last two years of his term, right? And so you get all of these undercurrents. Uh, the Democratic Party now has person after person saying, Joe, you got to go. You can't stay after 2025. I think the number one move on the part of the Democratic Party at this point is to make sure that he doesn't move for re-election. And I believe that they are a right, and I think they're actually going to succeed. Uh, nobody wants him to resign now because nobody has the slightest respect for Kamala Harris, who's his vice president. She is generally thought to be a total loser. She has no organizational skills, no intellectual skills. Uh, she's a terrible public spokesman. She manages to mess up every program that she's been in port of charge of. So nobody wants him to go at this point. But yes, the situation in America is very parlous. And if it turns out that Donald Trump wins the Republican election, um, my guess is he will lose to a respectable Democrat. And God knows what will happen if he and Biden run. But it's a sign of genuine sort of failure of a political system have two political candidates running for the most demanding office in the world, and they're both in their late 70s or their early 80s. I mean, I'm still working, but I'm on year-to-year -year contracts, right? You know, it's not the same kind of thing. And uh, you should never, ever do that. Um, in fact, I am now in favor of a constitutional amendment which says, you know, you can serve as president up to, say, the age of 70 or 75. After that, adios. We don't want you around anymore. Ronald Reagan left office at 77 if you recall. And yeah. Biden was older when he entered office than Reagan was when he left. Um, and, and that's also a sign of something deeply wrong in this country and that entrenched and influential political powers seem to be able to resist anything from below. So we have a gerontocracy. Nancy Pelosi is 82 years old. She's been around for a very long time. She's third in succession to the presidency. It would be a complete catastrophe if that woman were to become president of the United States. So I think this country is in sort of very bad shape. Um, and I'm, if you notice, I'm talking mainly about structural and institutional kinds of arrangements. I'm not trying to talk about my own policy preferences, although uh, they are all systematically disregarded in that case. If you look at the foreign policy stuff, the debacle in Afghanistan, I mean, I don't even know how to describe this. A uh, friend of mine um, named Tim Kaine wrote a little piece in which what he noted was that the number of American deaths in Afghanistan in the last 24 months before we left was zero. And so we're pulling out troops to save lives. We actually worked out a modus vivendi with the Afghanis that was working. 
And now there's going to be mass starvation in that country and thousands upon thousands of people are going to die and have their lives ruined because we just were in this reckless situation to start to get out by a president who still hasn't admitted that it was a boneheaded move. Um, so when you get somebody like that, um, an executive has immense power in the United States and foreign affairs. And he's utterly unable to deal with them, as far as I can tell, pretty much everywhere. He's messed up the Saudi thing. The Ukraine is going to be the worst of all things in the following sense. We're giving them just enough so that it could be bled to death before they lose. That is, either you basically break the blockade and allow them to shoot at Russian sites that are shooting at them, whether they're in Russia or not in Russia. You cannot possibly hope this war to end on a a term. You're dealing with a complete monster and you have to treat him as such. So, I mean, uh, if you're looking at what I'm seeing about this country, I, I'm more pessimistic about the fate of the United States now than I've been in my entire professional life. And I'm trying to look to see, you know, powerful signs in the opposite direction. There are many such signs. But at this particular point, I think of Woodrow, not Woodrow Wilson, Winston Churchill. Do you remember his famous expression? Too little, too late? Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's what I want. Is the reaction going to have that characteristic? I can't be positive about everything. And, you know, you have to continue to soldier on in whatever way you can. And I try to speak as much as I can and as forcefully I can. Um, you don't want to speak in the same kind of tones as the people on the other side of the issue. You want to be a little bit more reason, a little bit more restrained, but very intellectually insistent that we cannot continue to move in this current way. For the, um, the benefit of listeners in my own country, when you talk about red and blue, of course, red are you know, uh, the Republican states, blue uh, Democrat, the opposite of the way we might think of it in this country where we call conservatives blue and Labor red. Uh, that's an important distinction. They've swapped completely, if you look at a map of America. It's the reversal has been unbelievable over the last few decades. But What's uh, the point I just want to draw out here is that you make very powerful points, but you're not making them as a reactionary against um, the blue states or the blue politicians or even blue policies. In other words, you're not simply adopting a politically uh, uh, oppositional approach to the Democrats. You are yourself a classic, I think you used the term yourself, a classic liberal. That's your position. And a classic liberal uh, I wish there were more of them in this country because most of them have become libertarian. It's quite different. They seem to know hey, the boys that are... answer to everything. A classic liberal believes in the restrained role of government. Well, of course, that's where a lot of the whole issue that Roe versus Wade surely comes from. America's a federated place where as many rights as possible were to be left at the state and local level, not centred in the institutions of a federal um place called Washington, or, you know, the federal capital, such as Washington. So I just, it's, it's really important, I think, that we just understand that you're not simply coming at this from a, you know, they're all terrible because they're that side of politics. You're coming from a classic liberal position. 